Buenas tardes. Much better. Ah, thank you for that introduction. Um, I also like to thank uh, Charlie de Nord, Drew Fraser, Sundog, and uh, my wife Lauren. It's right there. Um, you're going to be hearing uh, poems from floaters, so the last book, but also some new poems. Uh, from my forthcoming collection, uh, Jailbreak of Sparrows, which will be out next April from either Knopf or Knopf, depending on how you want to pronounce it. They're coy about it. I'm going to start off with the title poem of my last book, which uh, is still sadly relevant. June 2019, two Salvadoran migrants, father and daughter, who came to be known as Oscar and Valeria, drowned crossing the Rio Grande. A photograph of their bodies went viral, you might remember it, uh, sparking outrage, sparking grief, but also sparking skepticism, or what we now know as trutherism. There was a post in the I-1015 Border Patrol Facebook group charging that this photograph was a fake. My poem speaks to this photograph and to these charges. Uh, Floaters takes its title from the term used by many members of the Border Patrol to describe those who drown crossing over. And so, again, floaters, epigraph. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask, have y'all ever seen floaters this clean? I'm not trying to be an ass, but I have never seen floaters like this. Could this be another edited photo? We've all seen the Dems and liberal parties do some pretty sick things. Anonymous post. I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group. Like a beer bottle thrown into the river by a boy too drunk to cry. Like the shard of a styrofoam cup drained of coffee, brown as the river. Like the plank of a fishing boat broken in half by the river. The dead float. And the dead have a name. Floaters say the men of the border patrol, keeping watch all night by the river, hearts pumping coffee as they say the word floaters, soft as a bubble, hard as a shoe, as it nudges the body to see if it breathes, to see if it moans, to see if it sits up and speaks. And the dead have names. A feast day parade of names. Names that dress all in red. Names that twirl skirts. Names that blow whistles. Names that shake rattles. Names that sing in praise of the saints. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez. Say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos. See how they rise off the tongue. The calling of bird to bird somewhere in the trees above our heads. Trilling in the dark heart of the leaves. Say what we know of them now they are dead. Oscar slapped dough for pizza with oven blistered fingers. Daughter Valeria sang, banging a toy guitar. He slipped free of the apron he wore in the blast of the oven. Sold the motorcycle he would kick till it sputtered to life. Counted off vessels for the journey across the river and the last of his 25 years and the last of her 23 months. There is another name that beats its wings on the heart of the trees. Say, Tanya, Vanessa, Avalos, Oscar's wife, and Valeria's mother, the witness, stumbling along the river. Now their names rise off her tongue. Say, Oscar, Valeria, 
He swam from Matamoros across to Brownsville. The girl slung around his neck, stood her in the weeds on the Texas side of the river, swore to return with her mother and had, turning his back to his father's do, who later say, I turned around and she was gone. In the time it takes for a bird to hop from branch to branch, while Eddie had jumped in the river after her father. Maybe he called out her name as he swept her up from the river. Maybe the river drowned out his voice as the water swept them away. Tanya called out the names of the saints, but the saints drowsed in the stupor of birds in the dark, their cages covered with blankets. The men in patrol would never hear their pleas for asylum, watching for floaters, hearts pumping coffee all night on the Texas side of the river. No one, they say, had ever seen floaters this clean. Oscar's black shirt yanked up to the armpits, but they his arms slung around her father's neck. Even after the light left her eyes, both face down in the weeds back on the Mexican side of the river. Another edited photo. See how her head disappears in his shirt, the waterlogged diaper bunched in her pants, the blue of the blue cans. The radio warned us about the crisis actors we see at one school shooting after another. The man called Oscar will breathe, sit up, speak, tug the black shirt over his head, shower off the mud, and shake hands with the photographer. Yeah. The floaters did not float down the Rio Grande like Olympians showing off the backstroke, nor did their souls float up to Dallas, land of rumored jobs and a president shot in the head as he waved from his motorcade. No bubbles rose from their breath in the mud, light as the iridescent circles of soap that would fascinate a two-year-old. And the dead still had names. Names that sing in praise of the saints, names that flower and blossom with white, a cortege of names dressed all in black, trailing the coffins to the cemetery, carved their names in headlines of gravestones they would never know in the kitchens of this cacophonous world. Enter their names in the book of names. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez, say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos, Bury them in a corner of the cemetery named for the sainted archbishop of the poor, shot in the heart saying mass, bullets bought by the taxes I paid when I worked as a bouncer and fractured my hand 40 years ago and bumper stickers read, El Salvador is Spanish for Vietnam. When the last bubble of breath escapes the body, may the men who speak of floaters who have never seen floaters this clean float through the clouds to the heavens where they paddle the air as they wait for the saint who flips with the keys on his ring like a drowsy janitor till he fingers the key that turns the lock and shuts the gate on their babble tongued faces and they plunge back to earth a shower of hailstones pelting the river the Mexican side of the river children's book about Roberto Clemente was banned and then unbanned in Florida uh, and I was there. So here's a Clemente story. Uh, Puerto Rican Baseball Hall of Famer Roberto Clemente died on New Year's Eve 1972 delivering earthquake supplies to Nicaragua. I was 15 years old. I had left Brooklyn, where I was born, and was living in Valley Stream, Long Island, and naturally, we were the only Puerto Rican family in town. So, this poem is called, Big Bird Died for Your Sins. Barry was six foot six, 15 like me, loading layups and hook shots over our heads through the hoop in my driveway. 
We call him Big Bird for dwarfing us, for his slappy feet, for the mouth that hung in a grin, in all our stories. We called him Big Bird because he would yell, foul, every time anyone bumped him under the basket, as if we lived on Sesame Street. I liked Big Bird and his white boy afro. He never called me a greasy-haired spick under the hoop in my own driveway like Frankie the Clown on the Black. On New Year's Eve, Roberto Clemente himself set foot on a prop plane at the airport in Puerto Rico, my father's island. Boxes for Nicaragua stacked up after the earthquake, knowing the dictators Guardia Nacional would crack open the crates, greedy as a pillaging army, and he did not loom over them. The DC-7 engine, like a smoker's heart, 4,000 pounds overweight, sputtered a hundred feet above the trees, then spiraled into the sea on a night when the moon deserted the sky, the keeper of a lighthouse dreaming drunk. A crowd kept vigil on the beach. His compañero, the catcher, dove and dove again. Between the fins and sliced the waves till the propeller's twisted hand rose from the sea, but never the body, never the ball player, never Clemente, never. My father told me, Roberto Clemente is dead. I could swear my father's eyes were red. I had never seen my father cry. This must be hay fever in winter. My mother saw him cry once, watching the funeral of JFK on television, the black riderless horse and the empty boot and the stirrups for the fallen. Later, the day after the baseball writers voted Clemente into the Hall of Fame, as the boys under the hoop toweled off and scooped up cokes from a cooler, I said, when my father told me Clemente died, there were tears in his eyes. No one said anything, not even Frankie the Clown. Big Bird stopped grinning. Big Bird was thinking. The whine in his voice was gone when he finally said, they only did that because he was Puerto Rican. They only did that because he was black. There was once an episode on Sesame Street where Luisa Maria taught Big Bird about the meaning of death. How we all die one day, and his yellow head drooped heavy as a sunflower. I feel sad, he said. I could have rolled the numbers out like a dice in my Stratomatic baseball board game. 317 lifetime average, 414 in the 1971 series, 3,000 hits, 12 gold gloves, the only walk off inside the park grand slam in baseball history. I could have called on the spirit of a dead ball player to flood the screens in their heads with the leap and stab of the ball against the wall in right field that saved the no-hitter, the bark of the ball off his back that fractured a pitcher's leg. I said nothing. I never said anything, even when Frankie would croon his favorite song in my face, Spicka Spooka. The other boys would bathe in it. The next game began. I guarded Big Bird. I stomped on his slappy feet, spiked my elbows into his ribcage, ran shoulder after shoulder into his back, blocked shots by jamming the ball into his chest. I knew nothing of karate, but kicked the air every time I had to rebound away. Foul, yelled Big Bird like a song on the jukebox nobody wanted to hear. Foul. This was my hoop, so I couldn't foul out. I wanted to see Big Bird cry like I saw my father cry. Big Bird sniffed. No one saw him sneeze. He squinted hard, but we all knew. That day, Big Bird died for the sins of the fathers who cursed at the dark ball players on TV in the living room where their sons could hear it all. I had a vision of Big Bird rising above the palm trees, igniting in the air like a feathery piñata too close to the spark of a cigarette, 
crashing into the sea, the sharks feasting on yellow feathers, Luis and Maria on Sesame Street, explaining the meaning of a puppet's death as the nation mourned. Well, um, lacking any athletic ability whatsoever, I became a lawyer. Indeed. Um, in fact, um, I was a tenant lawyer. And uh, I worked with Su Clinica Legal, a legal services program for low-income Spanish-speaking tenants in Chelsea, Massachusetts, right across the Tobin Bridge from Boston, um, and uh, that's where this next poem comes from. It's called, The City Wears a Coat to Bed. The white army of winter spreads across the city. Boilers and radiators die in their sleep, their skin cold to the touch in the morning. The city wears a coat to bed. The city watches the wraith of breath rise in the kitchen. On Friday afternoons, the judges slip off their black robes and drive home. There is no light in the windows of the courthouse. There is no one to read the affidavit or sign the injunction to shove into the landlord's hand so that he courses through the heart of the boiler and the looping hard veins of the radiator again. No one to hear the tenant's story translated, her sons and daughters shivering in their coats and a mattress, snot on their sleeves. The judges and the landlord home or stopping in a bar on the way home, she tells me instead the lawyer who speaks Spanish and explains in Spanish why there will be no heat this weekend, why there is no one at the courthouse to listen. And still, she pours her story into my ears till they swell to bursting. I walk her to the doorway of the office. The secretary is in the bathroom, the office space heater in the corner. Suddenly, I am steering the tenant out the door with the space heater in her arms as she says gracias over and over, and I say, okay, okay, knowing the secretary would yell my name louder than the time a drunk with a lightning scar in his belly charged through the door, naked, but for his socks and a Salvation Army blanket. The secretary would not miss the office space heater till Monday. I am the hero of this story, riding the bus home across the bridge, till I remember the words I should have said about the glowing coil too close to the mattress, how every week another fire rolls the smoldering wraith of winter through the bedroom as sons and daughters sleep, how every week the EMTs tuck white sheets over bodies dead as a landlord's boiler. I will dream with eyes open of windows, the coils of space heaters, and the coils of mattresses glowing in every window. to listen whenever he spoke in the circle at the rehab center, some with eyes shut, seeing his confessions of addictions, demons, and sobriety's angels at war. 
No one knew Gonzo signed his name with an X. The tutor at the rehab center held up flashcards and sounded out the letters A, B, C. There was no alphabet song in Gonzo's head, no teacher at the blackboard. He said the letters one by one. At the letter S, he stopped. The tutor studied Gonzo's nose, long, but not as long as the nose of the Muppet with the same name. S, she said again. Gonzo had no front teeth, no place for his tongue to go. He puffed and sprayed, a man unable to navigate the river of his own name, Gonzales. He hid his face in his hands, unlettered cards in his head, as if the tutor could not see him now. A sob surged through him, a beast chained to the rock of his ribs for 50 years since the days the roosters woke him up for school in Puerto Rico. He wiped his face clean. Gonzo was clean, clean fingernails, clean shaven, clean white shirt. The tutor waited, thinking. He doesn't know his letters, but he knows every street in Patterson by name. She squeezed Gonzo's wrist once, then again, till his eyes met hers. She held up the next flashcard. She said, Say T. So, um, Lauren's reward for being such a good person is that I am now writing a, a series of love poems for her in the voices of strange, rare, sometimes extinct creatures. So, um, I lost a contact lens the day of the reading, seeing everything double. And then we saw a one-eyed fish in this sad little aquarium. So guess who I am in this poem? <laughs> Love song of the one-eyed fish. I circled the tank in the aquarium waiting for the school groups to tumble down the aisle like acrobats escaping the circus clowns on their day off. They chatter about all the sharks they want to see, the dolphins to feed. They stop at my tank on tiptoe fingers streaking the glass and then they scream at the hole in my face. I am the one-eyed fish my eyeball scooped out of the socket by another fish in a fight over who would hide in the rusty cylinder at the bottom of the tank, the authentic recreation of my environment in the bay. The teachers scream at the school groups to stop screaming and say to each other, is that all? Is this it? We have no sharks or dolphins here, nothing on the second floor, only a can for donations by the door and a one-eyed fish bumping up the glass. <laughs> One morning, after I stare with my eye at the janitor mopping the floor, waiting for the seventh grade to yell in my half face, I see the flash of you, an angel fish in my tank, proof that the gods of the aquarium are benevolent, that they checked the rusty cylinder at the bottom of the tank and figured out why the other fish was always sleeping. I am a fish in a tank, doomed to swim in circles forever, and so I cannot hide the hole in my face. Yet you do not flip to the corner of the tank or dive into the rusty cylinder. You swim with me, and you circle the tank together. The school groups tumble down the aisle on cue, and the teacher says, look, an angel fish. If I could
I sing, that would be the name of my song. Look, an angel. about time. I got this. I got this. I, I'm going to read one more. One more? One more? One? Uno. Un. Un poema. Repita clase. Un poema. Ah. So, um, you heard in the introduction all about my father. My father, Francisco Luis, Espada, Frank Espada, was born in the mountain town of Utuado, Puerto Rico, in 1930, and died in Pacifica, California in 2014. He was indeed a community organizer, uh, a documentary photographer, a leader, some of the people would say the leader of the Puerto Rican community in New York in the 1960s and early 70s. So, when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, I suddenly saw Utuado over and over again on TV, on the internet, and in headlines. As John Lee Anderson put it in the pages of the New Yorker, Utwalo had become, quote, a byword for the island's devastation. And keep in mind that 4,000 people died. So I started talking to my father, who had died three years before. Actually, I started talking to his ashes in a box. That was the genesis of this last poem, which is called Letter to My Father, October 2017. This last poem in the book folders. You once said, My reward for this life would be a thousand pounds of dirt shoveled in my face. You were wrong. You are seven pounds of ashes in a box, a Puerto Rican flag wrapped around you next to a red brick from the house in Duala we were born all crammed together on my bookshelf. You taught me there is no God, no life after this life, so I know you're not watching me type this letter over my shoulder. When I was a boy, you were God. I watched from the seventh floor of the projects as you walked down into the street to stop a public execution. A big man caught a small man stealing his car, and everyone in Brooklyn heard the car alarm wail of the condemned, he's killing me. At a word from you, the executioner's hand slipped from the hair of the thief. The kick was high, was all you said, and you came back to us. When I was a boy, and you were God, we flew to Puerto Rico. You said, my grandfather was the mayor of Ufalo. His name was Buenaventura. That means good fortune. I believed in your grandfather's name. I heard the tree frogs chanting to each other all night. I saw a banana leaf and elephant palms sprouting from the mountain's belly. I gnawed the mango's pit and the sweet yellow hair stuck between my teeth. I said to you, you came from another planet. How'd you do it? You said, every morning, just before I woke up, I saw the mountains. Every morning, I see the mountains. And Utwalo, three sisters, all in their seventies, all bedridden, all Pentecostales, who only left the house for church, lay sleeping on mattresses spread across the floor. When the hurricane gutted the mountain, the way a butcher slices open a dangled pig, and a rolling wall of mud buried them, leaving the four sisters to stagger into the street, screaming like an unheeded prophet about the end of the world. And Utualo, a man who cultivated a garden of aguacate and carambola, feeding the avocado and star fruit to his nieces from New York, so the trees in his garden be headed all at once like the soldiers of a beaten army, and so hanged himself. 
Don't wallow a welder and a handyman, bring the pulley or the shopping cart to ferry rice and beans across the river where the bridge collapsed. Witness the cart swaying above so many hands and raise the sign and pull the helicopters. Campamento los olvidados. Can't have forgotten. Los olvidados wait seven hours in line for a government meal of skittles and Vienna sausage, or a tarp to cover the bones of a house with no roof, as the fungus grows on their skin from sleeping on mattresses drenched with the spit of the hurricane. They drink the brown water, waiting for microscopic monsters in their bellies to visit plagues upon them. A nurse says, these people are going to have an epidemic. These people are going to die. The president flips rolls of paper towels to a crowd at a church in Guaynabo, Zeus, lobbing thunderbolts on the locked ward of his delusions. Down the block, cousin Ricardo Bernice's boy says that somebody stole his can of diesel. I heard somebody ask you once, well, Puerto Rico needed to be free, and you said, tres pulgadas de sangre la calle. Three inches of blood in the street. Now, three inches of mud flow through the streets of Utualo, and troops patrol the town as if guarding the vein of copper in the ground, as if a shovel digging graves in the backyard might strike the ore below, as if La Rigada swinging machetes to clear the road might remember the last uprising. I know you are not. I have the proof. Seven pounds of ashes in a box on my bookshelf. Gods do not die. And yet, I want you to be God again. Stride from the crowd to seize the president's arm before another roll of paper towels sails away. Thunder, Spanish obscenities in his face. Banish him to a roofless, Rainstorm and Utualo, so he unravels one so sheep after another till there is nothing left but his cardboard heart. I promised myself I would stop talking to you, white box of gray grit. You were deaf even before you died. Hear my promise now. I will take you to the mountains where houses lost like ships at sea, rise, blue and yellow from the mud. I will open my hands. I will scatter your ashes. And dwell. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much.